Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our course, VC310. Um, let's take a moment to pray and we'll get started. Uh, may I request somebody in the class, online class, to pray and we can start? Um, let's pray. Lord, Lord, we want to thank you for this morning. As we come before your presence, we pray that you would speak to us, help us to understand and listen and comprehend Lord Jesus and also to apply this in our life, in our ministry, and everything that you have given us. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. Right. Good morning, everyone. And um, we have been uh, learning a lot of practical things from uh, church and ministry administration today. We will uh, move forward. Let me just go ahead and share them here. And we're going to talk about, um, well, let me just finish, I think, a little bit. Uh, we were talking about systems and processes last week. And uh, we went through various examples. And um, what I just want to kind of, in the, in the last part, is that uh, it, it, for us to, uh, you know, to keep improving, uh, there are these three things we need to do, uh, which is to monitor, analyze, and then repeat. Uh, correct, take, take some, make some adjustments. So uh, that's something that is ongoing. That means we always monitor. That means we check how things are going. Then we analyze the results. And that means we have to actually look at data, we have to look at numbers. Yeah, uh, I can't. We cannot make uh, decisions on just whims and fancies. Oh, I feel like this. I feel like that. No. Uh, what is the actual? You know, what is actually happening? Uh, so that's why we need to collect data and analyze it, and then we can take you know whatever action is needed to keep improving. So. Uh, I just want to encourage that, um, and uh, again, uh, our focus is not just on the numbers, but numbers are important to help us make good decisions. Okay. So uh, everywhere we are looking at the numbers, you know, financially or any other things. But uh, it's not that we're focusing on the numbers, but the numbers are giving us some information that will help us make good decisions. So from that perspective, uh, we need to monitor, analyze, take results. Today we go to lesson number seven, which I think is a very important part of church and ministry, which is uh, staff management. How do you manage uh, the people who are working in the ministry, who are, who are part of the ministry. And I remember, you know, sometimes as I travel around, uh, uh, when I'm in conversations with pastors, Christian leaders, you know, we, we can talk freely, we share our problems. And uh, sometimes, and I've heard, you know, for example, one pastor came and shared, he said, you know, I, uh, I hired one person from church to come and help me in the office, with some administrative work. But this person comes when she wants, <laughs> she goes whenever she wants. And uh, she will come very late, 11 o'clock. She might go off by 3 o'clock. Uh, and the uh, pastor is afraid to say anything because if he says anything, he's afraid, he's afraid she might leave the church. So then he's coming and asking me, so what should I do? How do I handle this situation? Because there is work to be done. Uh, he has engaged this person to from the church to come and do the administrative work. But this person doesn't, like, you know, comes and goes as and when they please. And, uh, but pastor is afraid, you know, how do I tell that, hey, you come in the morning, work full day, do all this work, you know, uh, how do I do it? So then I had to, you know, I just asked, did you give an offer letter? Like, did you say, you know, what 
this person is supposed to be doing did you put it in writing you know like in a letter what time they must come what are the days of the work the week they must work like you know monday to friday or monday to saturday or are they going to work saturday sunday whatever it is and did you put it in writing no 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 i just said come uh, work with your so there was nothing written so there's no even that person doesn't know what is expected by the pastor is expecting that person to come at nine o'clock that person doesn't know it's not being communicated clearly so like that we were just having a conversation and i was just sharing some thoughts so uh, the point is that uh, church staff people are working full time for the church or the ministry uh, if we do it in a proper way everybody will be happy you know from their side and from our side everything will go fine uh, and so the question is, how do we do this in a proper way? So, uh, uh, so in APC, and I'm just sharing uh, from uh, what we have. We have people who are called staff. These are full-time people, full-time uh, salaried staff of the church. They will get uh, uh, a monthly salary, and they're full-time. Then we have what is called as consultants. Consultants are paid hourly, and so that means they're not, uh, you know. So they're giving them the freedom uh, to work how many ever hours they can. You know, sometimes they may not be able to work uh, like full forty hours every week. So uh, if they're not able to work full eight hours a day, maybe they are homemade or something like that. So it's okay. You work as a consultant. Means whatever hours you can work, you work. But in some cases, we'll say, you know, at least work 20 hours you know, in the week because we need certain amount of work to be done. Uh, so we need at least so many hours. However, there's flexibility. So they are consultants. Uh, and many of these consultants work from home. You know, so the staff, uh, most of the staff will work from the office or by the college or wherever. They work from there. Consultants, we have flexibility. And then we have a lot of volunteers. Volunteers are non-paid staff, but they're also very important because uh, they will, they're contributing their time and their skill. And uh, a lot of the work uh, is being done by volunteers. So part of the ministry, especially in the church, is how to manage volunteers. And volunteers are the biggest group. So we have around, I don't know exact number, but I would say around 300 volunteers. So our church staff may be 30, consultants maybe another 10 or something. I, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's around this 30, 10. And then there are volunteers, around 300. So the volunteers are about 10 times more than the staff. But volunteers are very important. They may not be, they're not working, they're not being paid. They may contribute, you know, five or six hours a week, usually on the weekends. Some of them may be during the week, they will do something, uh, whatever they can. But uh, they are the big part of what is happening. So we must take care of them also. And very important, the interaction between staff and volunteers is very, uh, how to say, it has to be managed very carefully. Okay? The interaction between staff and volunteers. Because, uh, you know, uh, both have their own, <laughs> what to say, attitude or perspectives of things. Volunteers, you know, feel like, hey, I'm giving my time freely. You know, you can't tell me what to do. I'll do what I feel like, <laughs> that kind of thing. Staff are like, hey, we have to get this done. You know, they may want to. Uh, uh, you know, put some pressure or, you know, want to get things done, so on and so forth. So that, that relation between staff and volunteers have to be managed very carefully. Sometimes there are problems, we have to sort them out. So all of these things we want to discuss in this lesson. So I just explained uh, staff and uh, consultants and so on. Now, how what should we do? So I'm, very important is the hiring process. You know, that means 
if we can make our hiring process very good, then we can bring the right people in. Then uh, a lot of the problems can be uh, taken care of there is because if you bring somebody in you give them the role you just give them everything and then after two months you realize oh, yo, they can't do the work or they're not a good good worker then it's a problem you know how do you tell them hey you're not doing well <laughs> that becomes another difficult issue itself so it's better to avoid that go through a good hiring process so uh, it is good so uh, just to uh, you know uh, give an idea of how we do the hiring. So first is we tell people to make the application. And so on our church website, we have uh, on our employment page, we have all the open positions are, uh, announced there. People can send us their resume. So let me just uh, share, uh, you know, just, just to give an idea of what we have on our, on our employment page. Sorry, one minute. Let me just pause this. Um, okay. So let me share this now. All right. So in our church website, we have an employment page. Uh, it's a piece of contact employment. So under here, there's employment page. And this is where we announce all our open positions. Our uh, uh, positions are there. And we tell them very clearly how to apply. They have to uh, complete this prospective employee personal statement, this this document in Word or PDF. They also have to include the resume. They have to send an email to this, uh, along uh, to this email ID, along with the resume. And they have to give us their de some details, which is their full name. If you're currently, currently employed, who's an employer, what is the recent salary, which local churches which you are in front of. And what we do is we announce all our open positions here. So these are all the open positions. They're looking to hire people. And we have a role description for this. Right? So this page is you know, regularly updated when there are new positions open and so on and so forth. Uh, so people can come here, they can read the role description, and they can make an application for a particular role. Now, we are very uh, particular. That means if the first thing we check is, have they followed the instructions here? Right. Sometimes, even after all this, it's not sometimes, very often, they'll just send one email with the resume. They won't fill in, they won't complete this prospective employee personal statement. Okay. So then we don't even process those emails. Like, say, hey, if this person cannot even follow basic instructions, then what work are they going to do? <laughs> right. So we don't even pay attention to that. Or sometimes, they may send their resume, they may send their prospect employment, but they won't give us this information. They won't type this in the body of the email. Again, like we just leave that email out. So, like, so this is like our first screening, right? Can they follow basic instructions? If they can't even follow these basic instructions, you don't even you don't even open, you don't even handle that resume. Right? But for other people, who actually follow these instructions very clearly. Like they've given the resume, they've completed the statement, they have uh, given us this information correctly in the body of the email, then it's okay. Here is somebody who can read and follow instructions, right? We want to work with them. So then we can, you know, take it forward. So this is our first, you know, uh, screen. And uh, let me go back to the PDF. So, so then uh, we get the resume, uh, the interview process, we review the resume, of course. You know, we look at the resume, is there a match to the, 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 the role that they have applied? 
Now, there is no perfect resume. Like, there is no perfect candidate. It's very rare that you'll find somebody who's a 100% match to any role. Right? Generally, if, if people are 70% there, it's good enough. You know, you'll never find a perfect person. I mean, if you do find somebody, that's that's wonderful. But you know, if it, at least if their resume shares so shows that, yeah, they have seventy percent of what we are looking for. That is good enough to start. Right. So from there, uh, so we identify the candidates. That means at least there's a seventy percent match, and then there's an initial phone screening. So in the initial phone screening, we are just trying to check their. Uh, we have certain questions. Uh, some of the things that we check is okay, they're English. Can they speak good English? Um, the other thing here in the initial, when you're looking at the resume and looking at the personal statement, is we check their English, right? Uh, so in the personal statement, what they have written, uh, if there's a lot of grammatical mistakes, their English is not good, we immediately, we don't even go beyond that. So we check their English, we check what they have written. So uh, even the resume, if there are a lot of typing errors, grammar errors on the resume, then it shows us that this person cannot, is not doing a good work. Their own resume has mistakes and, how, you know, how much, how will they treat, you know, other work. So those are things we do, you know, in the initial, before even we do a phone call. You know, how is the resume? What have they written in the personal statement? Is it all good? Is it a 70 person match? Okay, that's fine. So assuming there's seventy percent match, then move forward. Phone screening. Okay. Phone screening on the phone when they're talking to them. Uh, we are looking at their English, their spoken English. Can they communicate properly? And also, you know, uh, their motivation. So we would ask things like, "Why are you interested in working for the church?" You know. Uh, so we want to see that they're genuinely interested in serving God. You know? It's not like, oh, uh, I'm just looking for a job. Any job will do. <laughs> you know. So we ask certain questions. You know, uh, why are you interested in the church? Sometimes over here, you know, uh, for example, I, I, we may ask questions like, "What do you know about APC?" Then it's so surprising. Even some people who've got a lot of experience, they have not made an effort. To even learn something about APC. You know, they have a lot of experience. Maybe they work. I've asked some questions. Sometimes I ask that question in the final round when they come and meet me. You know. So, what do you know about APC? Uh, this person is, you know, a lot of experience. And he's, he's stumbling. Out. I don't. So, that means he has not made an effort to even go to our church website, understand who we are, what we are about. Then, it's like, okay, you're just applying for a job, but you, you, there's no interest in the organization. You don't even know what ministries we have, what we're doing. You know? So these are questions we can ask, maybe in the initial phone screening or maybe even in the final round. You know? So a typical question, what do you know about APC? And we see what kind of answer they give us. You know, If they can't talk about it uh, and, and tell us why they want to work for APC as a church, then it's like, okay, this person just looking for a job, you just send the resume here, try it. But if they're really passionate, they would make an effort to understand the organization, why, you know, why they're excited about working for this organization. What is their match? So have they done their homework before coming in? So sometimes I also find I ask them, so uh, you know, uh, what do you know about this role? So, you know, so what they have done is. And they may not be able to talk about it. So that means they have not even read the role description. They just apply, fill in the form, send it. And ask them, what do you know about this role? They don't know anything. So that means they have not made an effort to prepare for the interview, not made an effort to prepare for the role they are applying. So then we don't even want these kinds of people. Like they've not made an effort to understand what they're applying for, to prepare for the interview. Uh, to understand the organization. So these kind of things we can do in the initial phone screening itself. Like on the phone, we just ask. Them. And uh, if these, if they if they satisfy these things, the initial phone screen, and you feel like, yeah, this person is generally interested in serving God, 
uh, they have a genuine uh, desire to serve people for ministry, and they have made an effort to understand who we are, to understand the role that which they're applying for. Then we can take it forward. Right? So, so we are. We are so what we're doing is we're putting the effort right in the beginning to make sure we bring the right people in, right? Then we can you know build a good team and do a good work. We're not hiring just for the sake of it. Then. After the initial phone screen, if they do well in that, then we take them to the next round, which is uh, sometimes there's a practical assessment, uh, especially if it's a technical role, you know, like if somebody is applying for IT or media. So then we give them a practical thing. Like, okay, example, if he's an IT person, it's okay, come. We're going to give you a two hour uh, practical exam. You come to our office, we'll give you a computer, this is, and we're going to do this. And we will look at the work or the media, you know, to our, you know, create a video or a graphic or whatever. So um, we will do a practical assessment. If it is, you know, if, if it is relevant to the role, otherwise there's an in-depth interview. And I will give you some sample questions, what we ask. For example, let me just share this. Uh, let me just uh, show you examples uh, of a... Uh, you know, uh, in, in depth question. So, um, I, I will share these samples uh, in the classroom, but I'll just uh, uh, share some, uh, look at it now and we are. Just give me a minute. Let's open this video. Share the screen. Okay. So this is uh, the prospective employee statement which we have on our website. Uh, you know, we we ask them some basic questions. You know. What is your life vision? Uh, how working at ABC will help them fulfill that vision? What is their personal testimony? How do they, you know, what has happened in the journey of faith? How have they been involved in Christian ministry? And some references that they can provide. Right? So these are, uh, this is the perspective statement. Then sample interview question. This is just an example, right? So, uh, like this, we have for different roles, we would have some very detailed questions. So uh, this has been filled up in the personal employee statement. We asked them, okay, so how was your personal spiritual life? So this is, a, this is for a pastoral role. These are questions. I would, so actually, this interview might take at least two hours. You know? so, but we want to understand the person in depth. Okay? Now, uh, especially if it is somebody whom we don't know well. Suppose it's a person who's already been in church, already been serving. Uh, we would know them quite well. But if it's somebody from outside apply, then we will take a little bit more time to understand. Too. So, you know, so uh, ask them about their Bible study, etc. Um, how, how do they study the Word of God? Their preaching and teaching. Um, some theological questions. Some pastoral questions. Uh, something about you know if they're if they're going to be in a leadership role if they're going to be organizing managing uh, then working with people handling finances integrity and then yeah there's this what do you know about it? we seek any question so these are these are things that uh, we would you know we would generally go through asking them uh, for, you know, how they did so this would be in the in-depth interview like about two hours. And then, if that is good, then we would have, usually we'll have a group interview if they are going to be part of a team. So, example, if somebody's going to be part of the pastoral team, uh, we'd like other pastors to also meet with them, at least two or three other pastors to meet with that person. If they're going to be part of the 
uh, example, ITT. Okay, they've done the IT interview, but if they're going, especially if they're going to be having some senior developer roles, okay, we'll let the other IT people also talk. To them. So just we want to see if everybody's comfortable in relating to this first. So they've cleared all the technical knowledge, all that they have. Now it's about is everybody comfortable relating to that person? So that's the idea of the group interview. Um, so most often people are going to be working with teams. Right? They're going to be part of something bigger. So that's why we have this group interview. But if it's going to be somebody working all by themselves, we can skip this group interview. Uh, and then there'll be a final round with me. Okay? Uh, uh, sometimes I myself might do the in-depth interview if it's a pastoral role. But if it's other roles, other people are handling that. So, and so in, in the final rounds, uh, again, I would just, you know, I'll share some questions we asked, but the final round is like, okay, everything is clear, but I want to make sure that are there any red flags, you know, uh, things that uh, you know, could cause problems in the organization. Right? So they may have the skills, they may have the motivation, but are there any danger signs? So you uh, can check that. If everything goes well, we'll make a job off. And the job off also, it's a written letter. So uh, I, I, and I'll give you a sample of it. So what are some of the things we check for when we are you know, going through this interview process? You see this on page 23. <clears throat> we want to check their motivation. So why are they applying to uh, ABC on page 23? Uh, what is the reason to want to work in, in a church, in a ministry, Christian ministry? Uh, of course, uh, we need, they need to have skills in calling. Uh, if they have experience, you know, the, if they have relevant experience. One of my favorite questions that I like to ask uh, is, my favorite question is this. If you were given a blank piece of paper, and you could do anything you want to do in this world. No limitation of money or anything. No limit. What would you do? So I put a blank piece of paper in front of them and I'll say, ask the question. If you can do anything you want, what would you do? So this is to see, you know, do they, if they say, okay, if I could do anything I want, I will go and play football or I'll go, you know, play something like that. But they're not saying anything about this job or this opportunity or serving God. Then we know that this is not priority. Okay? Something else is priority. This is only okay. I'm just doing it as a job. Yeah. But if they say that if I can do anything, I want to go and serve people, I may go and start a church or I may go and uh, you know, do some, you know, start a ministry, something. I thought, given the freedom to do, that's what I will do. Then we know that there's alignment you know, for ministry and so on. So it's a good thing. So it's, it's, uh, so it, it shows us, you know, what, what is this person really after? So those kind of things. Um, and then uh, also we want to see if there are any, you know, red flags, dangerous attitudes. So, you know, we ask, we could ask questions like, you know, why, why, why are you leaving your previous job? Why are you leaving your current job? Or why did you leave your previous job? Um, uh, or if they, and if they start talking bad about their boss and start talking bad about their previous pe workplace people, then you, those are all red flags. Those are not good signs, you know? And, uh, anyway. um, other red flags, you know, also if anybody arrives late for an interview, finished. Okay, that's it. We won't even take it forward. Uh, unless they have a valid reason. You know, suppose there was some heavy rains or there was some accident or, you know, some, some big thing happened. But generally, if a person comes late for an interview, everything ends there. We don't take it forward. Because that is telling us, uh, hey, you don't value this enough to make it a point to come out. And we don't take, you know, there's too much traffic. Uh, that's, you know, that's, we all know there's traffic. In the city, so you have to plan. 
you know, if it's going to take you one hour to come to our office, you should leave one and a half hours early. That's your responsibility, not our right? So there have been times when you know I've, I just these things have really happened. Uh, we've set an interview for about four o'clock in the afternoon, three forty-five. Somebody will call. This candidate will call saying, uh, "Asta, I'm just about to leave for the interview. It will take me forty-five minutes to come." I said, "Don't even come. <laughs> Don't come. Finished." At the end, you know, because hey, you know it's going to take 45 minutes. Interview, you're supposed to be here. The interview starts at four, you're supposed to be 10 minutes before the interview. That's the right way. That means you should leave at three o'clock or 2 45. So, such things have happened straight away. I said, Don't even come, please. Thank you. So, these are basic things that you know you need to get right. How do you how do they treat the staff? So, as soon as they come in. We have our, you know, our front office reception, you know, office manager sitting there. How do they treat them? Do they say thank you, you know, or are they rude or that? So if she gives me feedback saying, "Hey, this person came and he just spoke to me very rudely, or he didn't treat me well," finished. So we just that's it. Because how do they treat? How do they treat every place? That is important. So these are these are little things we look for. Uh, do they speak negatively about past employers experiences are they uh, judgmental critical about other denominations churches uh, so in the interview we, we're lo looking at this how are they speaking about other churches other denominations um, so my uh, here's another question what do you know about abc you know if they haven't done their homework then they're not interested uh, if uh, if they are not you know they appear disinterested in the role uh, sometimes they are vague in the responses. So I ask one question, they'll be talking about something else. <laughs> then I say, hey, please answer the question. You know, they, they go off on some other story. Then they actually, it's, it's an indication they're actually trying to cover something. Huh? You know, they're not answering the question directly. Um, then these are things that. Uh, so, and then we make it a point that in case family members of people are already apply, working apply. Um, you know, if they just go to the same interview process, we don't do any preferential treatment. So that's something we do. Then we also do some background checks, uh, especially we check the social media. Right? So uh, that means, hey, go go check their Instagram, go check their Facebook. What have they? What are they putting up there? You know. So if there's anything that is of concern. Then that's a red flag, you know. If there's whatever, you know. So uh, people don't realize it, but in many cases, employers will check social media activity because that way you know what they're doing outside uh, and how is it going to impact, you know, the work. Uh, so we do check their social media or, or online activity and uh, background checks, uh, and depending on. If there are situations where uh, we feel that we need to call somebody, like if the references that they have given, we would do that. Check them. Are they okay? But definitely we check social media to see you know, if there are any red flags. So assuming if everything goes fine, uh, we will then give them an offer letter. And we also tell them you know, in the offer letter to uh, read the staff guidelines and so on. So let me just give you an example. I, I put the samples up there. Uh, sample of a letter. I'll share this with you. So um, typical, this is a sample of a letter. Yeah. So the name that is, so we're happy to have you join. So what is their role? What is their start date? And uh, the, the details of the role is that in the PDF. So they know this is what you're going to be doing. There's going to be a starting salary. And then of course, you know, as you grow in the organization, your role and your responsibilities will increase and so on. And then, they have to read our staff guidelines. So we have a, uh, I'll go through our staff guidelines. So we have a HR document, a staff guidelines that tells them everything about what they can expect when they work at JPC. 
So we tell them to go through it, sign it, and send it back to us. And uh, that's it. So the offer letter is very simple, but it connects to the, it also mentions their role. It also mentions our HR document, which uh, they need to read and follow. So, uh, so this offer letter is very clear that this is going to be your starting salary. This is your role. This is these these are the guidelines you have to follow when you're working with the organization and so on. So we give them the offer offer letter, right? So let me just go through our staff guidelines and then we will you know uh, pause and take um, take any questions uh, that you have. Um, so, oh sorry, so let's open this PDF. So for all our church staff and for all our consultants, uh, we have this um, staff and consultant guide. This is like our HR document, right? Before they join, they have to read this and sign off on it. They agree to how we want to work. Okay? So. Uh, in our staff guidelines, I'll just quickly go through. I'll give I'll give you a copy of all of this. You can you're most welcome to change it and use it. So we share with them. Okay, this is the vision of the church. This is who we are. What do we do? And uh, what what is expected from you as a church staff or a consultant? Uh, we give them a little bit about our destiny, what we are working towards. Uh, we tell them a little bit about our organizational structure, so they understand that then our core values and our culture we have a separate lesson on core values and culture i'll explain that so they understand you know we take them through this core values and so on and uh, how we work uh, what we expect them expect of them when they're working at uh, apc we also have a code of conduct now you know in a in a private organization uh, you cannot say all this <laughs> Because people can drink and smoke, you know, their private life is their business. But because we are a church, for us, these things are important. You know, that no smoking, no alcohol, uh, uh, no unethical dealing. So this is part of our code of conduct. And if they cannot agree to this, we will not hire them. Uh, and we can do that because we are a religious organization. We are a church organization. So we can make these as requirements if you're going to work for us. So we, we spell it out here so that there's no uh, there's, there is no uh, you know misunderstanding. Also, we deal we handle a lot of people information. You know that means we handle the information of people in our congregation and so on. So we need to keep that information private and confidential. So we cannot uh, misuse that information uh, and other these things. Uh -huh, you know and um, we have, you know, typically, uh, if somebody's joining us who is fresh out of college, uh, they will go through a three month probationary period. If they are already experienced people, then we skip this probation. And uh, we have a one month's notice. So, either way, if we are dismissing them or they're leaving us, we typically say, You give us one month's notice, either way. Uh, so, we have staff and consultants, and sometimes we take interns or training, trainees who will work with us and then they might decide to join us full time. Um, so all our staff, they have medical insurance and uh, um, uh, uh, they receive the what is called as employee product, product and that's the retirement savings and they are paid vacation. So a consultant will not get those benefits. So a consultant is free to work whatever hours they want, they won't get these benefits. A full-time staff who gets these benefits and so on. And a trainee won't get it until they do it. So work hours, we spell here, you know, you have to work at least 40 hours a week, typically Monday to Friday, um, eight hours a day. Now, some of us are working on Saturday, Sundays because our main work, I mean, our ministry work happens Saturday, Sundays. So then we keep it a little flexible for those who do that. So all these are details here. Um, uh, and then everybody reports their time in our um, timesheet, an HR system. I'll show you that later. 
this is how they will be paid, their salaries, uh, this is how many vacation leaves, sick leaves they can have, etc. Uh, how to apply for leaves, um, you know, uh, public holidays. So basically, all how they can work with us as an you know work you know everything is already stated here. They just have to read it and then we all of us follow uh, same thing. Uh, so, so all of these uh, things are spelled out here. Uh, interaction with church members, you know, we have to be careful how we interact with people in the congregation. That's important. Uh, there's a, they can have access to uh, counseling. How do we decide on salaries? We show them, you know, th these are the important for us. Uh, what, how much can they expect? Every year we revise salaries, so what can they expect? How much increase can they expect year on year based on the work uh, bonus for those who um, are full-time staff? How is bonus calculated at the end of the year? Um, so on, so forth. Right. So all these things are spelled out in the document, and uh, anybody joining us will read this. They will understand and follow this. Okay. So let me pause here. Any questions so far? Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but any questions so far in just how we hire somebody into the church? It seems very complicated, but actually it's very important uh, that we do all these things so that uh, people are very clear what it means to work for the church and the ministry. Any questions? How long is the interview process? It's a lot. It all happens in one day. How long is it? Uh, the interview process would typically be spread out over a couple of weeks. Right? Uh, so that means initially there's a, I mean, they send us, it's an example, to some, we receive a resume. So example, today I received a very interesting resume from somebody who is part of the church. Uh, she's, she has applied for one of the open positions there. So what will happen is we will check, you know, like I said, we will check everything. Then uh, now, because I know this person, it might go a little faster. But if they, we don't know the person, then we have to, you know, do the phone screening, then do the detailed interview, we'll schedule a day, you know. So if we do the phone screening today, we have to ask them, when are you available for a detailed interview? So based on their time, our time. So if they're not available this week, Maybe next week we'll schedule it whenever they're available. Then if all of that is okay, then a group interview. So that could happen the same week or that may happen following week. So if everything goes well. So we would say, I would say generally two, three weeks. Uh, sometimes it could be faster if everything goes quickly or it may take a little longer also based on their availability. Or availability. But uh, I would say not more than four weeks. Within you know two to four weeks, we can finish everything, and we will make a decision. So within a month. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. So did they want to? Um, yeah. Okay. So the question is, after we hire somebody, then we see, uh, you know, some something wrong in their behavior or conduct. Or so. so how do we deal with that? And I, I will I will talk I will talk a little bit on this later and give some examples. But generally, uh, what we do is uh, we have a three strike policy. That means we give two chances. If the third time it repeats, then they will be dismissed. So example, first time something they, you know, I'm not talking about performance. Performance we deal with differently, but I'm talking about, let's say, they get into conflict with somebody or they, you know, they they, they don't treat somebody properly. I mean, they you know, get into it or something so anything that's bad so first we give them a warning one time say hey please be don't do this be careful so that's one one 
if they repeat it. Second one. Please. Third time. Same thing is repeated three times. So two times plus one. So three strikes. So let me follow that because they've given two warnings. And if they're still repeating it, then we'll have to listen. And we tell them that, look, uh, this is how we work. Right? That we'll give you two warnings. Two times we're okay, but third time we're repeating it, then we have to discuss. Uh, if it has to do with performance, then we see, okay, what is the problem? And why they're not able to do the work? Sometimes they don't have the skill. Then can they go and acquire that skill? So we tell them, hey, you need to work on this. Sometimes, for example, it's as simple as English. You know? Uh, I would say, hey, you need to improve your English. Please do these courses. If they don't do it, I'll, I'll wait for them to do it. I maybe give them six months. If they don't improve the English, then they cannot have that role. We'll have to move them to some other role where that is not very important. They can do a work without that, that skill and see how they do with it. So uh, when it's performance, we try to help them. But if they are still not able to perform, then again, we follow the same thing. So there is three, you know, two strikes and all. But each time we are actually helping them to develop that skill. Or sometimes we may reposition and give them a different role. If they have different skills, they can maybe be good at something else. We will try. If none of that works out, then we have to release them. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, what we do, uh, so the question is what about the uh, employee provident fund, retirement fund? Yeah. So, that starts from the beginning. So, from the time somebody joins as a full time staff, if they're on probation, we don't do it, but once they pass the provision, like they finish their three month period, they become a full time staff, permanent staff. Every month, the PF is already paid into their account. So that's a government rule. So we will, you know, credit the, the PF to all their accounts. So every, it's, it's always done. And then they leave. Again, they follow the government rule. Uh, if somebody has worked for us for at least five years, then we have to also give them gratuity. That means that uh, in addition to PF, they have to be paid an extra amount for, uh, there's a calculation the government has given us, the government has given, where for every year of service, they have to get so much money, so much percentage of their salary. So we'll also calculate the gratuity and give it to them. And either when they leave or when we dismiss, either way, we have to do it. So we follow the, the government rules when, when the staff leaves. Okay, let's pause here. We'll continue this and uh, feel free to ask your questions, please. Thank you. We'll come back in 10 minutes.